His Excellency Raja Muhammad Zafarul Haq Sahib, uh, Leader of the House, Senate of Pakistan, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum and good morning. I am Asfa Tanveer and on behalf of Institute of Policy Studies Islamabad, I would like to formally welcome you all to IPS seminar on <coughs> pluralism versus exclusionism, the case of rising extremism in India. Pluralism, which was focused on bringing every ethnic, religious, cultural group to one table, highlighting the similarities and respecting the cultural differences, is now being faded into exclusionist ide uh, ideologies. This makes, our com makes us committed to bringing together uh, all the groups on one table and start a dialogue and debate. Ladies and gentlemen, May I now take this opportunity to request Director General IPS Khalid Rahman to please come up here and give his welcome words. Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Senator Raja Zafrullah Saab, Chairman of this uh, inaugural session of the seminar, Ambassador Abdul Basit, our keynote speaker in this particular session, Eminent panel of speakers, excellencies, members representing various uh, organizations, faculty members from the universities and think tanks, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and dear students. It's a great pleasure and privilege for me to welcome you all to yet another important event of the Institute of Policy Studies, Islamabad. Today's seminar is devoted to a topic of crucial importance in the contemporary context, pluralism versus exclusionism, the case of rising extremism in India. Ladies and gentlemen, while most of you have participated in various IPS sessions and are well aware of IPS history and its working, let me take a few minutes to very briefly share some information about the Institute and its focus for the benefit of our guests who are joining us for the first time and I can notice many such faces in this hall. Established uh, in 1979 as an autonomous, not-for-profit civil society organization, IPS is dedicated to promoting policy-oriented research and providing a forum for informed discussion and dialogue on issues of national and international significance. Interaction, dialogue, thematic research and capacity building programs are instrumental in our research endeavors. We operate as a self-financed think tank, counting on endowment, sponsorships, collaborations, voluntary services, and private donations. Ladies and gentlemen, at IPS, we are engaged in research in three broad areas. Pakistan studies, which covers aspects such as Pakistani society, education, economy, politics, and security. International relations, that includes regional and global politics. And third, faith and society, which focuses on religious trends, thoughts, and movements. You would agree that all these three themes have a direct link to the seminar we are holding today. And in view of the recent developments, this should be regarded as a timely contribution. We all know that exclusionism and extremism are not in any way new phenomena. Nevertheless, what could be regarded as new is the kind of rapid transformation of the world over of rapid transmission the world over with respect to the ideas and practices of pluralism, 
particularly since the start of present century. The phenomena become even more significant in the sense that it is gaining strength even in those societies and countries which would declare pluralism and multiculturalism as their identity and secularism as their ideology. Take for example the case of Europe. In most cases, you will find a general trend almost across the continent that far-right parties are successful in attracting greater number of voters and consequently improving their numerical strengths in the parliaments. In Germany, it is AFD. In France, it is National Front, headed by Jean-Marie Le Pen. In Netherlands, it is the Party for Freedom, or PVV. In Italy, it is the Five Star Movement, and the list goes on including Austria, Switzerland, Hungary, etc. Even Scandinavians, including Denmark, Finland, and Sweden, are no exceptions. Ladies and gentlemen, it is true that these far-right parties are still on periphery and not in the mainstream of power. Yet, they have successfully altered the political discourse shifting it from politically incorrect to acceptable political narratives. One of the most glaring examples in this context was the response of European countries to the refugee crisis in 2016. The case of India is much more significant in the present scenario. We all know, ladies and gentlemen, that the politics of extremism and violence has remained all along a dominant trend in India. In fact, there has rarely been any waning in the events of abuse and discriminated treatment of minorities in India. Yet, except for major events, these practices remained less discussed until recently as they had no apparent public backing from the governments. The attempts made by the BJP in last around three decades to assume government by playing the Hindu card has disturbed even the exhibitory balance of pluralism and secularism in India. While the Indian constitution still declares secularism as the country's ideology, the presence of organizations like RSS, Bajrang Dil, and Shiv Sena, along with their subsidiary and allowed outfits, outfits at the societal level, and their increasingly violent attitude towards minorities and Dalits, backed by the government, is nothing but a practical example of contradictions in Indian secularism. Even the former Indian President Parnab Mukherjee had to acknowledge it. During his speech on the Indian Independence Day in 2016, he said, and I quote, in these four years, I also saw with some disquiet forces, with some disquiet, forces of decisiveness and intolerance trying to raise their ugly head. Attacks on weaker sections that militate against our national ethos are aberrations that need to be dealt with firmly. This was in 2016, and reports of independent sources suggest that the contradiction since then is on further rise in India. How long the current trend will continue? Indeed, it's a difficult question to answer. What, however, can safely be assumed is that as long as the extreme behavior of Hindu nationalists persist at the government and social levels, it will keep growing and consequently weakening India from within. With India having more than 20% of its population consisting of minorities and another 25% of Dalits, neither it is possible to destroy that big segment of population, nor can they permanently be ignored. 
the scale at which actions against minorities are being taken, the possibility of having opposite reactions cannot be ignored, which has the potential of negative repercussions for all other segments of the society in India. <coughs> Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, given the fact that India is the second largest country of the world, according to its population, and is an important player in international politics, the discriminatory behavior with minorities will not only cause internal destabilization, but will also have far-reaching adverse impact on the region in particular and on the world at large. <coughs> Under the given circumstances, the situation poses great challenge for all concerned, both within India and outside. This is the overall context which has led IPS to host this event, and I congratulate our team for their collective efforts and hard work which they have put in to make it happen. I'm glad that we have a galaxy of scholars and experts gracing the occasion. Through the deliberations, we expect to not only understand the dynamics of the rising phenomena of extremism in India, but also to measure the responses within, as well as of the regional and international community, and also to deliberate upon the strategies and ways to respond to them. With this, I conclude my these remarks and hope to have a very exciting session these, uh, to, throughout the day. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, as rightly uh, pointed out by you, given the fact that India is the largest country in South Asia, <coughs> and the violence against minorities therein has the potential to disbalance uh, the geostrategic conditions in the region and the world over. Now, I would like to request um, uh, Ambassador Abdul Basit to come up over here and deliver the keynote speech. <coughs> Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Raja Zafrul Haq Sahab, Khalid Rahman Sahab. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, very good morning and uh, assalamu alaikum. Let me begin by thanking uh, IPS for inviting me to share my views uh, on rising extremism in India. And I must uh, begin by, by a caveat that uh, do not expect me to uh, upbraid India or criticize India because I would rather prefer here to be more objective in my uh, whatever I say about this important subject. Because uh, India, uh, no doubt, is a big country, uh, as was mentioned by Rahman Sahab. Uh, it has a huge cloud around the world. <clears throat> so we need to understand uh, without any subjectivity as to what India is all about and uh, what can we expect from India in the years ahead. Because if India grows extremists and that extremism leads to violence, then obviously all these uh, have applications for not only Pakistan but for the, for the entire region. So my job as a former diplomat uh, and uh, a person who has also served in uh, New Delhi, I will try to share with you my own personal experiences as well in order to uh, get to the bottom of the problem uh, which our Western neighbor is currently facing. It is usually said, and it has become a cliche, that uh, India is a land of paradoxes. 
And uh, in my view, all countries, including Pakistan, uh, we're all uh, lands of paradoxes. But it is more said about India, reason being that uh, on the one hand, India has been able during the last 10, 15 years to become the sixth largest economy of the world, yet more than 300 pe million people is still living below the proverbial poverty line. India has been able to send its mission to Mars, but uh, I can tell you from my own experiences that uh, Thousands of districts in India are still without electricity. Even Prime Minister Modi in one of his statements mentioned that uh, there is a village in the suburbs of New Delhi which still doesn't have electricity. India claims to have you know, one of the largest pharmaceutical industries, yet you would find Indians struggling uh, to get medicines, to get reasonably good health care. So these paradoxes, in my view, are not, and you would agree with me, that are not limited to India. We also come across such paradoxes in Pakistan. But since Indians are, have this penchant uh, to claim that India is a rising country, shining country, and uh, Pakistan is no match, so we can then perhaps look at India more critically as to what India is all about. It is also said about India that uh, anything you say about India, the opposite is true. So let me today say everything good about India so that you can draw your own uh, conclusions about our neighbor. Uh, and there is no doubt that uh, <clears throat> since its independence in 1947, India, unlike Pakistan, has been able to move towards democracy, strengthen democratic institutions, uh, was quick to draft a constitution, uh, which uh, gives uh, reasonably, uh, I think, good protection to all minorities, uh, and more or less, it is considered as a secular constitution, and India has always claimed to be a secular country, where uh, people of all uh, ethnic backgrounds, religion, uh, faith, they have equal rights and uh, equal opportunities. And by and large, uh, I would say that uh, India uh, has been uh, more or less on the path to develop itself along secular lines. We can, obviously, uh, there are many events, uh, India, and India is replete with such events where you see uh, violence against minorities, uh, uh, rights, and so on and so forth. And it is very easy to uh, criticize India uh, for all these things, that despite their secular constitution, they have not been able to give uh, enough protect protection to minorities, as we have seen uh, the destruction of the ba Babri Mosque uh, Masjid in uh, December 1999, and then rights against uh, sex, uh, killing of sex, uh, also against Christians. Uh, so Indian history is full of such events, uh, which would clearly uh, show that uh, India is not uh, a secular state uh, in, uh, in its true sense, because minorities do face a huge problem at the hands of majority of Hindus. Now, we can always come across or can mention all these events, but that would not serve the purpose of this seminar. My idea is to highlight those variables, both dependent and independent, which I believe are the uh, fundamental problems in India, which lead to extremism. And uh, the government has, has not been able to address those issues because some of those variables are inbuilt in Indian society. 
And unless India get to grips with those variables, it will continue to be very difficult for India to address the issue of extremism. And that is, I think, the uh, focus of my uh, uh, talk today. We all know that uh, India uh, is a, Indian society uh, is, is built or is based on uh, the caste system, uh, which uh, the lead iconic leader Ambedkar, uh, he was very critical of that, and uh, he regarded the caste system or the social, the social order of India as one of the most regressive in the world. So one of the reasons as to why India has not been able to deal with extremism, one factor is the caste system in India. Because it is inherent in that system, that socio-economic order, that uh, if there is undue socio-economic mobility within that caste system, that inevitably generates tensions. And if there are no proper mechanisms to contain those tensions, those then ineluctably lead to extremism and then violence. Whatever we are seeing today in India under Prime Minister Modi is not something new. Uh, the elites have been, you know, the, the lower caste or the, uh, the, the caste untouchable, so to say. Uh, they have been, you know, uh, uh, have suffered violence throughout uh, uh, Indian history. So it is not something new about it. So this is one area where, uh, which needs to, be, uh, uh, needs to be understood if we want to understand as to why uh, there are problems uh, in India related to uh, extremism. Then obviously there is a, another important uh, element which leads to extremism in India is the Muslim rule in India over the last, for, 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 for more than 600 years. Hindu of India has still not been able to reconcile with, with that part of its history that how come Muslims ruled India for over 600 years. So now whatever today we see in India, like changing names of roads from Aurangzeb Orang, uh, Road to uh, Abul Kalam, Azad Road, or uh, so on and so forth, all these things are a reflection of that uh, uh, difficulty for majority Hindus to digest that idea. And somehow they would like to uh, skip that period of their history, national history, as if nothing happened uh, from 12th century to 19th century. So that is one problem with, with majority Indians, that uh, they are still finding it very difficult to get to grips with this particular phenomenon. And hence, in order to, in their drive to skip that part of history, we see violence, we see extremism against Muslims, particularly against Muslims uh, in India. The third phenomenon, in my view, or variable, is the creation of Pakistan, the split of the subcontinent. That also raises many, many questions. I see here Iftikhar Gilani Saab, who is traveling from India, and he is a, he's a Kashmiri, uh, he would bear me out that uh, Pakistan is a kind of, uh, uh, in India, it's a, it's a permanent fixture on the psyche of uh, the Hindu mind, collective Hindu mind in India. If Shah Rukh Khan says anything or criticizes anything happening in the country, he is asked to go to Pakistan. If Amir Khan says that he and his family does not feel very secure in India, he is immediately advised to go to Pakistan. So anyone, any Muslim particularly, who says or comments on anything happening in India which is negative or uh, has some ad uh, adversary, adverse, adverse remarks, 
he or she is immediately advised to go to Pakistan. So Pakistan uh, is a variable which is kind of regressive as far as India's march towards progress is concerned. They have still not been able to come of age apropos Pakistan because Pakistan for most of them uh, has been an aberration uh, and that needs to be corrected. And this particular so-called aberration has been given uh, conceptual strength by organizations like RSS. And RSS, as you know, was not formed uh, after India's independence. It was formed back in 1925, and this organization was heavily influenced by one ideologue, Hindu ideologue, uh, Mr. Savarkar, uh, who genuinely believed that uh, India is a land of and land for Hindus, and uh, he then gave the concept of Hindutva, uh, the political Hinduness or Hinduism. So that led to the creation of RSS in 1924, 25 by Dr. Hejwa. And we all know that uh, uh, since its establishment, uh, RSS has been uh, the force which uh, propounded uh, to make India a land of Hindu, a land for Hindu. And this continues till today. We all know that uh, who killed Gandhi in uh, January 1948, that was Nathuram Godse, who was also very much influenced by the RSS ideology. And then Subsequently, you see many rights taking place uh, in, uh, in India. But luckily, luckily, uh, Indians have generally been not very positive about the RSS as an organization. That is why still, after 70 years, we still see uh, RSS, though it has a membership of close to 5 to 6 million people, it has not been able to deeply penetrate uh, into the psyche uh, of Indians. Having said that, RSS, since they focus on dedication and discipline, it has emerged as an important uh, social and cultural organization. And that is what they do. Uh, they claim that they're not a political organization. They are a social and cultural organization which, are, which is pro promoting uh, Hindutva, and they say so openly. Uh, and uh, many of their leaders do, uh, 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 do suggest that uh, even Muslims you know, should become Hindu as far as culturally, uh, if not uh, ideologically. So this is what the uh, theme of or the overall objective of the RSS is. Now we have seen that in the past too, RSS has been very active uh, from the destruction of Babri Masjid to, uh, to the Gujarat riots in 2002 uh, and uh, in which more than 2,000 Muslims were killed. So we have seen many, many such events in the past as well. But luckily, uh, their political wing, the BJP has was never able to get majority or form government on its own. Though in the 2000, we have seen Mr. Vaj, or 1999, late 90s and early 2000, we have seen Mr. Vajpayee or the BJP forming government as part of the coalition. But it was for the first time that uh, Mr. Modi, BJP under Mr. Modi was able to get a simple majority. And that was a huge, huge, uh, I think, <coughs> uh, uh, in the context of Indian politics, it was a huge development uh, for the BJP. <clears throat> and I think that changed the whole thing uh, in India, hence the uh, title Rising Extremism. What we have seen uh, during the last four years in India, it is... Uh, uh, prominent Hindu journalists, businessmen, uh, 
uh, even politicians uh, of different hues in India, and I could uh, I could see that uh, there is a worry uh, in India that if Mr. Modi continues in power and the BJP, if they win the next election in 2019, things can worsen uh, in, in the country. Because what we have seen during the last four years, <clears throat> uh, it is not really very encouraging in many, many respects. And I will give you one, two examples as to how minorities now feel in India. <clears throat> because uh, minorities, uh, they were already under pressure even before uh, Mr. Modi or the BJP took power in 2014. But now, under Mr. Under Mr. Modi, uh, who is seen as the, in Pakistan and elsewhere, and among the Muslim community in India too, as the butcher of Gujarat, uh, there are serious concerns about the future of India. Uh, that if we continue, if India continues on this trajectory, uh, it, it, it may not be able to uh, uh, remain secular in a strict sense of the word. And the problem here is that uh, since Modi fought election in 2014 on the basis of two planks, development and security, he has not been able to deliver, especially on the economic development agenda. Uh, rather, two major fiascos, demonetization and GST, have not uh, been able to achieve uh, the desired results. So on the economic front, uh, he, is, uh, he has not been able to deliver. So majority, uh, especially Muslims in India, strongly feel that uh, there is a possibility that in the run-up to the next elections in 2019, uh, there may, one may see more violence, uh, more extremism in India, because that helps uh, the BJP to consolidate the Hindu vote behind itself. Uh, because the Muslim vote uh, or the Muslim vote bank has become kind of, has become irrelevant during the last election. And I, we were not surprised when in the UP elections last year, the PJP did not uh, give a single, uh, not a ticket to a single Muslim candidate uh, in, in Uttar Pradesh, despite the fact that the 20% of uh, population of Uttar Pradesh is, is, is Muslim. But the BJP did not have a single candidate uh, for the UP election. And even today, if you uh, see the composition of, the, of Lok Sabha, uh, for the first time, the number of Muslim votes, uh, Muslim MPs, has come down to 22. Uh, so this is the lowest number of Muslims in, 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 as parliamentarians in Lok Sabha. So this is all very worrisome from, from, uh, for those Indians who genuinely believe in secularism uh, in India. So uh, in that context, since Mr. Modi has not been able to deliver on the economic front, uh, it is possible that he would see more extremism and perhaps violence uh, in, in India in order to keep the, Muslim, the Hindu vote behind the BJP. Because the, the elections are fought in such a manner that a party which is able to garner or get uh, 35, 30 to 35 percent of vote, uh, they are elected. So even the BJP last time could get only 31 percent of the total vote, uh, yet they managed to get uh, 272 uh, seats in, in, in Lok Sabha. So uh, this is what is going to happen in the months ahead. And we should be ready for uh, any untoward incident or more violence against the elites or, or Muslims uh, in, in the months ahead. Uh, similarly, uh, there are, we would also see manifestation of more uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi's attitude towards Kashmir uh, would harden uh, in the months ahead again. Uh, we have seen that how the mainland India is literally insouciant about whatever happens in, in, in occupied Kashmir. We have seen after the martyrdom of uh, Burhan Wani 
the use of pellet guns, hundreds of young you know, students uh, now uh, uh, losing their uh, eyesight, uh, partially blinded some, and uh, over 100 people got killed after the, uh, at the hands of S uh, Indian security forces. So Indian position vis-a-vis -vis Kashmir would also harden, uh, you will see in the, uh, in the months ahead. Similarly, dialogue with Pakistan, I do not see any possibility of that happening too, uh, because that would not be uh, commensurate with, uh, with Prime Minister Modi's strategy uh, and uh, Amit Shah's strategy, because if they engage with Pakistan at this point in time, uh, they would lose the central point of their uh, election campaign that uh, they that and, and the and the rhetoric that uh, quote unquote terrorism and talks cannot go together. So they have built their uh, 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 their position vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan on this basis that unless. And this is not something new, though. Even the Congress government used to say the same thing for a post-Mumbai attack in 2008. But they are doing it with more vigor, and they are more vociferous about their demand. So hence, we would see hardening of the BJP, Mr. Modi's policy vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan as well. And Kashmir uh, will, uh, will remain like this. Uh, because, as I said earlier, the mainland India is least bothered as to what is happening in, in IOK, in Jammu and Kashmir. If Hurrier leadership is behind bars for the last eight years or they're under house arrest, they give a damn. Uh, and uh, I hardly see uh, Indian journalists of repute to talk about these issues. Though there are journalists, uh, some uh, people who would mention these things, uh, that this needs to be resolved politically, uh, but uh, there is no urge uh, to listen to the aspirations or to respond to the aspirations of the people of Jammu and Kashmir. So this problem will continue because extremism, uh, in a way, pays off electorally. Uh, extremism pays off in the elections, so that suits uh, the PJP government and the RSS. And the RSS, you know, uh, which uh, has now realized the importance of having power. Though they, are, uh, they claim to be a cultural and social organization, but lately I think they have understood the importance of remaining in power. Because if they are in power in what we have seen during the last, two, uh, last four years, that how efforts are being made to change the uh, curricula in different uh, school systems uh, uh, and uh, to, to, uh, uh, to uh, and, and from their perspective to put things, historical uh, facts in their correct perspective. So to host this event and I congratulate our team for their collective efforts. Authority of uh, Indians, India. So they are kind of, you know, trying to change uh, the history as well. And uh, this is again uh, a point of concern for the majority of uh, Indian Muslims. And uh, if this trend continues, then obviously RSS will find it closer to achieve its objective of Hindutva or making India a Hindu state. Though it is easier said than done because Muslims, you know, in India, uh, they are uh, about 170 million uh, people uh, and 14.4% uh, population uh, is not easy uh, to uh, ride roughshod over them. Uh, there are, there will be serious issues involved. Uh, we still do not know as to what is going to happen because uh, the next election, which uh, some people thought was a shoe in for Prime Minister Modi, uh, no longer seems the case because in Rajasthan, uh, Congress managed to win a uh, few by elections, and then in uh, Gujarat itself, the home state of uh, Prime Minister Modi, uh, Congress managed to do well, uh, winning almost 70 seats there. So things are changing uh, in India because. 
uh, majority of Indians uh, still believe that uh, uh, India's survival, its progress, its development is uh, with, with secularism. If India moves towards more extremism, Hindutva, as is the, uh, uh, as RSS wants to do or BJP is being used, then obviously there are serious issues. I remember, you know, visiting uh, Mumbai on many occasions and uh, every time I was visit uh, Mumbai, uh, I would find Shiv Sena people standing, you know, or uh, protesting outside, where, outside the hotel where I would stay. At one point, they even did not allow me to inaugurate a Pakistani exhibition there. So there are organizations like Hindu Mahasba, Shiv Sena, uh, VHP, and so many others uh, who who are not who these organizations do not have uh, 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 any you know support uh, huge support among the masses, but they do represent the mindset of the Sangh Parivar as to how they would like to tackle these issues, particularly uh, the Muslim issue and the issue of Pakistan and then Jammu and Kashmir. As far as the caste system is concerned, for some people that provides you know, the, the necessary glue for such a huge population to stay together. If there is no caste system, then perhaps India would uh, fragment. To what extent that contention is correct is anyone's guess. But caste system, in its uh, 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 there is an inbuilt mechanism in the caste system, which does create tension in the sense that, uh, uh, for example, the elites, you know, uh, or uh, the lower caste, uh, and there are thousands of castes in India. There are castes which are untouchable, and you would be surprised to know there are castes which are unseeable. You can't even see them, so they are restricted to. Of, uh, of many locations where you can't approach them, you can't see them, so on and so forth. But you know, in a changing world, in our transforming world, you know, where uh, uh, everything is, you know, uh, becomes available to you, we are, this is an information society, so it becomes very difficult to deprive any particular group from uh, moving ahead. So caste system uh, in itself, though regressive in nature, I think uh, the time will come when uh, the elites and other lower castes will become more vocal about their rights as enshrined in the Indian constitution. So this is a struggle which will continue for some time. Uh, and uh, it will take, uh, in my view, years uh, to overcome these uh, discrepancies in India. Uh, while uh, India claims to be a secular country, and in many respects it is, because we still find Indian media very vocal about issues, uh, and they do highlight these things. But uh, uh, this was a huge setback to see uh, the BJP winning on its own uh, the elections in 2014, and that has given more and more space to the RSS uh, to uh, propagate its uh, own ideological agenda of Hindutva. And if the 2019 elections, uh, we still see the BJP winning, uh, that would obviously reinforce this phenomenon. And we can see more uh, extremism uh, in India, which obviously is not good news for Pakistan, because luckily here in Pakistan, uh, despite uh, being an Islamic Republic, uh, religious parties here uh, do not get in any election more than six to seven percent of votes. Uh, we, by nature, in, uh, are moderate people, uh, and uh, uh, extremism, though there is uh, extremism in Pakistan, but that is not at that scale, unfortunately. So we are lucky in that sense. But if India moves ahead and Hindutva gets more. Uh, 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 in, in, if, particularly in the next election, uh, then things can uh, worsen uh, from our perspective as, as well. So with these remarks, I thank you very much for your patient listening. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Very rightly pointed out by Ambassador, Mr. Ambassador, Ambassador that three factors that 
play a crucial role behind uh, extremism in India are the caste system, the uh, resilience or uh, the resistance against the Muslim rule and the creation of Pakistan. Now I would like to request uh, His Excellency uh, Senator Raja Zafrul Haq Sahab to please come up over here and uh, deliver the inaugural address. Please welcome. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Brother Khalid Rahman, Director General Institute of Policy Studies, Ambassador Retired Abdul Basit, President of Ipri Islamabad, Excellencies, Distinguished Members of the Civil Society and Media, Respected Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. It's a great honor and pleasure for me to address this esteemed forum that brings together a very distinguished group of people with such diverse expertise. I would first like to congratulate the Institute of Policy Studies for arranging this thought-provoking seminar. Your continued resolve to highlight critical matters of political and social significance is nothing short of a commendable service to humanity in general and Pakistan in particular. I am also deeply encouraged to see in attendance the many representatives of civil society and media. You are our tethers which institutes, institutions can effectively reach out and sensitize various segments of society. Ladies and gentlemen, it is about time that the notions of equality and human rights are prioritized above all other matters. It is time that our growing social, technological and political progress should reflect as a widespread model of pluralism and not that of currently prevailing exclusionism. For us as Muslims, the Holy Quran and the Sunnah of Rasulullah wasallam, are full of messages and guidance that advocate the notion of pluralism to ensure equality and preservation of rights across all segments of society. Our religion teaches us the very foundations of basic human rights, harmony, and immense responsibility of judiciously governing all segments of society without any discrimination. It is something that democracies of today are striving for, but unfortunately, in our political and social economic quest, we are drifting away from the principles of pluralism. Ladies and gentlemen, I do not wish to single out India at this seminar, as many other democracies, including our own, face their own challenges to fight exclusionism. But the fact that India is considered to be the biggest democracy in South Asia, it represents itself as a case study from which we can all learn from. With its fading secularism and rising extremism, India represents to us an example of how democracies tread on undemocratic paths. This rising extremism in India is an indicator of a democracy skewing from its core principles of equality. The point to hold on to is that democracy is expected to reflect the varying opinion and sentiments of a society into a uniform reflection that serves all its segments. And when India is considered to be a leading democracy, in this region, a big question arises on its human rights violations in Kashmir and the frequent violence and extremism exerted within India against minorities, especially Muslims, Sikhs, Dalits. There is no doubt that Hindus make up almost 80 percent of India's population. It is unfortunate that rising nationalistic cries have led to a huge increase in violence against minorities, mainly based on caste and religion. 
I aim to remain non-political with my views, but an important factor that contributes to an increase in extremism also depends on the leadership. Unfortunately, Mr. Narendra Modi is the current Prime Minister of India himself has been the torch bearer of Hindutva. It thus comes as no surprise that during his tenure, the flag bearers of Hindutva have come out in great numbers and clearly with great confidence. This has fueled an increase in violence against the minorities in India under his tenure. Such trends easily help trace the path to a rise in extremism in India's case and almost all national agenda of exclusionism, especially with respect to Muslims, is in full swing. We hardly find any, any country in the world which is exclusively uh, inhabited by a single religious community. All m countries, members of the United Nations, have segments of minorities also. But there are countries which are living in peace with their minorities, and they respect their human rights also. But the case of India, and the new tactics of democracy shrouding their actions behind nationalism is deplorable. No political or social economic agendas should justify discrimination and extremism. Yes, there are differences in cultures, practices across every country. Yes, there are varying religion, religions and skin tones in those societies as well. But what the modern democracies need to display is the art of carrying all these segments of society under one umbrella of tolerance and justice. With so many experts in attendance at this seminar, especially our brother who has been an ambassador and has practical experience of the Indian society, I truly look forward to the detailed intricacies of my simplistic analysis. I am sure that the seminar will educate us all on such a complicated yet crucial challenge world faces on a whole. I am also certain that our cultural and social communalities with India make it the best possible example for us to learn from. I look forward to hearing your expert analysis and opinions. I hope and pray that Allah Almighty may guide us so that we can refrain from committing any form of injustice towards other human beings. I thank you all. Thank you, sir. May I now request Director General IPS Khalid Rahman Saab to present mementos to our esteemed guests, please.